Hello everyone, I'm Dr. David Smerden and welcome to Week 12, Evolutionary Games. And this is a very interesting topic, I think, where we look at the intersection between economics, evolutionary biology, and even evolutionary psychology. But before we get into that, let's take a look at the homework exercise from Lecture 11. This was called The Birthday of the Boss which is a lovely little brain teaser that you can test your friends on and your family. And like all good brain teasers, it seems like such an impossible question at the beginning, but there's a real sense of satisfaction once you get to the end, having logically deduced what the correct answer is. So if you haven't had a go at trying to solve this, uh, I recommend pausing the video now and having uh, an attempt yourself before we go through the solution. So just to recap this question, you and your colleagues know that your boss's birthday, uh, your boss called A, is one of these following 10 dates, uh, March 4th, 5th or 8th, June 4th or 7th, September 1st or 5th, December 1st, 2nd or 8th. Now that your boss A told you the month of the birthday and told your colleague C the day of the birthday. But you don't know the birthday, neither of you. You just have different pieces of information. So then the following strange conversation takes place. You say, I don't know A's birthday, but C doesn't know it either. C hears this and then says, well, I, I didn't know A's birthday, but now I know it. And after you hear C's reply, you say, well, now I know it too. And the crazy thing about this conversation is that somebody overhearing this who doesn't know the month or the day can work out just from this conversation exactly what the birth date is. It sounds crazy, but we're going to do the same thing. Let's see how we do it. Let's go through this conversation step by step. So what's the first part about this conversation? Well, we say we don't know what the date is. That makes sense. We only know the month and in every month there's more than one candidate. And we say that we know that C doesn't know the date either. Now this gives some information to C because if we know that C doesn't know the full date, then that means that the day cannot be a two or a seven. Now, why is this the case? Well, for what months would C definitely know what the actual birth date is. Well, C would know if the day is the only day out of the candidates, and that is the days two or seven. If it was a two or a seven, you can see it only appears once in the candidates. So basically what we're saying here is we know that it's not a two or a seven. Now, if we know what the month is, that means the month must not be June or December. It must be either March or September. So by us saying we know that C doesn't know, we are giving C the information that the month is not June or December. And then C says, I know what it is. So if C knows what it is now, what does that mean for us? Well, it means that the day that C knew cannot be five. Now, why is that? Well, let's look at the dates that appear under March and September. By knowing that it's one of these two months, C now knows the birthday. What if C's day was five? Well, then C wouldn't know the birthday because there's still the chance that it was the 5th of March or the 5th of September. So when C says, now I know, what C tells us is, it's either March 4th, March 8th, or September the 1st. And then we say, now we know. Well, given that we know the month, it can't be March because we'd still be undecided. So it must be September. And that's why somebody listening in from outside, just hearing this conversation and knowing the 10 candidate dates, can actually work out that it's September the 1st. Sounds like just a fun brain teaser. So what, what has it got to do with game theory? Well, actually, the way to solve this puzzle belies a fundamental assumption behind Nash equilibria and game theory, and that's called 
common knowledge. And we'll discuss that more next week. Let's get on to today's topic, evolutionary games, with a very colorful cover page that will make a lot more sense to you by the end of this lecture. At least I hope so. The theory of evolution. Well, this isn't a biology lecture, but we can say something about it to give some background for the evolutionary games that we're going to discuss. There are three key requirements for the theory of evolution in a species population, and they are variation, fitness, and selection. Variation means that in each new generation of a species, they're not perfectly identical. There are small little mutations. That means that uh, sometimes a fox will have a bushy tail, sometimes a fox will have a thin tail, for example. Or sometimes a turtle will have soft scales on its shell, and sometimes it will have hard scales on its shell. These small differences, even amongst the offspring when passing your genes down. And this correlates into fitness. So that is how well these mutations or different behavioral traits do in its environment is determined by its fitness. Now, if you have a fox who's got a bushy tail next to a fox who's got a skinny tail, probably this variation won't matter that much for fitness. But if you've got a turtle with a hard shell and a turtle with a soft shell, the turtle with the hard shell is more likely to survive being attacked. So in that sense, that small variation may affect the fitness of the turtles. And the third key requirement is selection. And this is what underpins the phrase survival of the fittest. Now, usually when we say survival of the fittest, we're talking about the actual individual itself is more likely to survive if, say, they're braver or they're taller or something like this. Well, that might be true in some circumstances, but actually in evolution, the phrase survival of the fittest is talking not about survival of the individual agent, but the survival of that agent's genes and that agent's traits going forward. So for example, if you've got a turtle with a hard shell and a turtle with a soft shell, the turtle with a hard shell is more likely to reproduce. It's more likely to stay alive for longer, sure, but that means it's got more chances to mate and more offspring will be produced, meaning that in the next generation, or looking at the overall population of, of turtles, there's going to be more with that trait of that hard shell. So that's the idea there, that small variations can lead to small differences in fitness, and those small differences in fitness represent the rate of reproduction in the future. And that's where the phrase survival of the fittest comes from. So let's try to compare evolutionary games by using our what, rational games that we've seen so far as our benchmark. So here's a rational two-player two-strategy game that we've seen um, before, or different variants of it. Uh, player one can play left or right, player two can play left or right. And I've put some probabilities there because when we think about solving for mixed strategy, we might say, for example, that player one plays left with probability P and plays right with probability one minus P. So we've got one player who's the row player mixing between two different strategies. That's slightly different to the interpretation of exactly the same graph for an evolutionary game, or same sort of table. Here, it looks similar, but the difference is that we assume that instead of player one, we've got a population of player ones. And in that population, we've got those who only play strategy left and those who only play strategy right. So for example, you might have a percentage of the population who is left-handed. They can't mix between being left and right-handed. They are left-handed, just like we have some foxes who have bushy tails. And then you've got, say for example, one minus X of the population with a share who's right-handed or with a skinny tail. So you've got shares of the population instead of our mixing probabilities, and they're playing fixed traits or strategies. By the way, when it comes to left-handed and right-handedness, that is an example that's been used in evolutionary game theory, but there is an exception to that, a very rare exception, uh, 
possibly the most famous left-handed tennis player of all time, Rafael Nadal, is actually naturally right-handed, but was brought up by his father to play tennis left-handed. And the reason? The father thought that being a left-handed tennis player gave you a strategic advantage. Strategic advantage, yes, we're talking about strategy from game theory, and that's because right-handers get very used to playing against other right-handers, not so good against playing other left against left-handers. Whereas left-handers play against right-handers all the time, right-handers being the majority of the population. So by being a left-handed player, you get that same experience against right-handers, but your opponent doesn't have the same experience against you. And that was the theory that the father had. Seemed to do all right for Rafael Nadal, who, even though he is right-handed, has a much bigger left bicep than right bicep. Anyway, moving on. What are the other uh, applications of evolutionary game theory besides tennis? Well, starting with biology, there's looking at the different traits of animals, not just the physical traits, but particularly those sort of personality traits or behavioral traits, like whether animals are aggressive or cooperative, nice to each other or not nice to each other. And we even look at those traits amongst humans, particularly in the branch of psychology called evolutionary psychology. That is, why have humans evolved to be nice to each other? It seems to make no sense. If it's survival of the fittest, we should just be selfish towards each other because then we'll get more food for ourselves when back in our ancestors days, which means we should reproduce more, our genes should be passed on, therefore the selfish ones are the ones who should prosper. So why are we nice to each other sometimes? Why are we altruistic, cooperative? And there are also studies in sociology that don't go all the way back in evolution, but look at customs and traditions amongst different cultures and people today. For example, why do some cultures shake hands when they greet each other, whereas other cultures have no physical contact and bow to each other? Or why in some cultures, when a man marries a woman, does the man's family pay some money to the woman's family, whereas in other cultures, when a man marries a woman, the woman's family pays some money to the man's family? It seems very strange if we all come from that same base. So looking at these sort of differences, customs and social norms and so forth, also ties into evolutionary game theory. We're going to look at basically two simple examples, um, which are the seminal examples for evolutionary game theory. That is the sort of the traditional, classic, most popular examples. And they're actually similar to what we've seen before. The first is the prisoner's dilemma. And given that we've already discussed the repeated prisoner's dilemma, if you haven't already, what I'd like you to do, and you can do it now, is to click on the link in the slides or just Google and go to the website, The Evolution of Trust. Go to the, the website, The Evolution of Trust, and there you'll find about a 15 to 20 minute game, an interactive game, where you can actually see the repeated prisoner's dilemma in an evolutionary context being played uh, on the screen and described really well. It's very nice and worth checking out and that'll make what's coming up uh, a little bit easier to digest. Okay, so if you're wondering where I got these little characters from, they're from that website, The Evolution of Trust. We've got our simple prisoner's dilemma, which we've seen many times before. And here we've got rather than two strategies that can be played by each player. So instead of a player one who can play A, always defect, or C, always cooperate, we've got two different types in the population. Those who always defect, those who always cooperate. And you've got their little, little costumes there, their little hats, and we don't know the share yet of these in the population. So that's how it looks. We've got a population made up of what they call all cheats in evolutionary trust or those who, ev the evolution of trust, so those who always defect and always cooperate. So we'll just call those A and C. And this is what happened. Pairs are randomly selected from the population to play a game. These are the steps uh, in, in the game. They just play this prisoner's dilemma once against each other. After they play it, the type who's got the higher payoff is more likely to reproduce. We just put those conditions into place and then we say which is going to be the fitter type. 
the A's or the C's. Another way to think about it is which of these two types do you think is more likely to dominate the population if you were to come back in a couple of years time or something. It's a little bit easier to think about this if we take the game steps through sequentially. So you've got a population of these cheating guys, these cooperative guys. We always just take out two, take out two, take out two. So we put them in random pairs, which we, we don't match them specifically to have an A with a C. We just randomly match them together. Then they play uh, the prisoner's dilemma just one time against each other. Those with the higher payoffs, like I said, have more reproductive success, which means, for example, that the number of children they have is proportional to their payoffs. The original players die, the new population of offspring start again from step one, being randomly matched and then playing the prisoner's dilemma. So that's one way to think about the different steps involved. How do we solve this sort of game for equilibrium? Well, we need to know what the probability is of meeting each type. We know it's done randomly, but that obviously depends on how big the majority is uh, in the population. So let X be the proportion of cooperators in the population. And let's work out what the expected payoff for A is in this environment, this one-shot prisoner's dilemma. Well, if an A meets another A, the payoff is zero. If an A meets a C, the payoff is three. The probability of meeting a C is X, so the expected payoff for A is 3x. Pretty straightforward. What about the payoff for C? Well, if C meets an A, C is going to lose 1. If C meets a C, C is going to get 2. So that's going to be 2 times x minus 1 times x. Ah, sorry, minus, minus 1 times the probability of meeting an A, which is 1 minus x. Apologies. Which ends up being 3x minus 1. So the expected payoff for A is always bigger than the expected payoff for C, no matter what the X is. So no matter what the starting proportion of cooperators is in the population. So that means that no matter where we start from in this group, no matter what the starting proportions were, if we look towards the future, come back in a few years time, sorry, I just realized I'm in the way again, a is going to be the fitter trait. A is going to dominate this population no matter what. I'll move myself over a bit there. So that's reasonably straightforward then. That was pretty easy to solve. And we can also think about this not just in terms of reproduction, but the way that they do it in the evolution of trust game, which is at the end of the round, a small proportion of the lowest scorers get replaced with the small proportion of the higher scorers. It doesn't really make, matter which way you think about it. It's the same idea. At the end, if you simulate the game, the A's are going to dominate. So what happens when the population is entirely of type A? We want to know whether this equilibrium is stable. Now, what do we mean by stability in an evolutionary context? Well, stability means it is resistant to invasion by mutants. I really like that this is the equilibrium condition because it sounds like such a saucy sort of name, resistant to invasion by mutants. Well, we've already had examples of the Hulk and Black Widow in previous weeks, but it's not those sort of mutants, I'm afraid to say. Mutants just mean other traits. So people or, or animals or agents of the other trait. So if the population is entirely A and the total set of possible traits are A and C, then mutant just means that other trait, C. So the question is, what happens if a small population of the cooperated, co cooperators come into the population? Do they get beaten off in future generations or can they invade and start to take over? Well, it doesn't matter in this case because even for a very small proportion of cooperators, a very small X, the cooperators will still be less fit and they'll die out. So that means that our all A population is stable. So we have an equilibrium of a proportion of a, of a population who always plays the same strategy and it's stable. 
So that means that A is an evolutionary stable strategy. And that's the term that we're going to use, ESS. So that's a strategy which once adopted by the population is resistant to invasion by any alternative strategy in the environment or by any mutants. There's a theorem as well that connects ESS to Nash and that is that every ESS is a strategy of a Nash equilibrium of the stage game. But the reverse may not be true, that is a Nash equilibrium of the stage game is not necessarily an ESS. So if we go back to our original game here and think about it in terms of the stage game, a normal rational game that we've seen before, and we work out uh, what the Nash equilibrium is, well we've just got a normal prisoner's dilemma in a normal prisoner's dilemma here with dominant strategies, A is the dominant strategy, so AA is the only Nash equilibrium. And yes, indeed, what we've found is that our evolutionary stable strategy is a Nash equilibrium. Okay, we know the problems of the prisoner's dilemma and we know that it ends up in this situation where defecting is the right outcome. But we've also seen, looking at the repeated prisoner's dilemma, that we can sustain cooperation as an equilibrium in certain situations. The question is, can we do the same in the evolutionary environment? And this is important because we know that humans have evolved to cooperate. So if we want evolutionary game theory to make any sense at all in explaining human personalities and traits, it needs to be the case that we can show that cooperation can be sustained even in an evolutionary game. So consider again our prisoner's dilemma, and now we're adding in a new character. We're adding in what's called copycats in the Evolution of Trust website. But we'll call them T because there are too many C's for this game. Because a copycat essentially plays the tit-for-tat strategy. It starts out cooperating, and then it will do whatever you do back. If you cooperate, it'll cooperate. If you cheat, it'll cheat. And we've seen that the tit-for-tat strategy actually does reasonably well in a repeated prisoner's dilemma. So let's make this repeated. We'll again pull out random pairs, and when you've got a random pair from the population, they'll play against each other exactly twice. Type T is going to start by cooperating and then copy the partner's strategy from the first round. So let's try to write our payoff matrix, our stage game payoff matrix, as the payoffs would be after playing two rounds against each other. Well, when A plays A, they're both going to defect and they'll get 0, 0, and they'll get 0, 0 in the next round as well. So our first cell there is actually the sum that comes about after two rounds, 0, 0. What about when A meets T? Well, we know that A is going to defect, T is going to start by cooperating. Once T sees that A has defected, T is going to defect on the next round, so will A, and they'll get 0, 0 in the next round. So it's still 3 minus 1 in the first round, and then plus 0, 0 in the next round. So it doesn't change, it's still 3 minus 1. The only thing that does change is when the tit-for-tat player plays another tit-for-tat player because they'll cooperate in two rounds and so they get that extra benefit. And that's why we see that we've actually replaced their score from being 2-2 two, two to being 4-4. Four, four. So how does this change things? Well, it's already looking a little bit better for the tit-for-tat type. That's tough to say, tit-for-tat type, because they've got that extra 4-4. Four, four. So let's see if it really makes a difference. Well, pairs are randomly matched. They play the game twice. Those with the higher payoffs get more reproductive success. The original players die, and the new population of offspring start again from step one, same as before. Let's follow the same logic. Let's get those expected payoffs out. Expected payoff for A hasn't changed. It's still 3x. But the expected payoff for T is a little bit higher than it was um, for our cooperator before because it's now four times the probability that a T meets another T let's call that probability X minus one 
times the probability of meeting an A, which is 1 minus X. So it's minus 1 times 1 minus X. Overall, we get 5X minus 1. And 5X minus 1 can be bigger than 3X for some proportions of X. So which type is fitter? Well, T is fitter than A when 5X minus 1, the expected payoff for T, is bigger than 3X, the expected payoff for A. And when does that occur? That's exactly when X is bigger than 0 0.5. Now you can see that logically here, but if you had more types, you would do exactly what we did when solving for mixed strategy Nash equilibria with multiple types in the rational games that we've seen, which is to draw these sort of graphs. But here we see when C is bigger than A in terms of fitness, expected fitness, and when C is smaller than A in terms of expected fitness. Now, does it matter that we're talking about expected payoffs here? Well, not really, because we're considering a large population. And across a large population, those expected payoffs are actually going to materialize into actual payoffs when we compare the two populations uh, against each other. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, if more than half the population is T, then from then on, type T is fitter and its share will continue to grow. Now, why is this the case? Well, you're more likely to match with another T when there are more T's around. And that's where you're getting the gains from, from the other T's. So that's what you want, because you earn six in that case, while an A only earns three. And that's sorry, that's in the extreme, that's in the extreme environment. If less than half of the population is type T, then A is fitter and its share continues to grow. So exactly the opposite situation. And the reason is you're more likely to meet another A. So uh, C is more likely to meet an A and that's when it really hurts C. Whereas when an A hurts an A, it doesn't really hurt A, it's just getting zero. So overall, there's going to be this extra growth coming for A. So what does this mean? Well, there are two uh, stable evolutionary equilibria here. They are both situations where only one trait dominates the population. So one trait, monomorphic. So that's the extreme situation when the entire population is A or the entire population is T. And in fact, both of these are the Nash equilibria of the rational stage game that we've seen. What about exactly when X is equal to 0.5? I mean, if we've got these extreme Nash equilibria of zero and one, what about that mixed strategy Nash equilibria, which is exactly the case when you've got that 0.5 uh, proportion? Well, that's not an evolutionary stable strategy. Even though it is a Nash equilibrium, it's not stable. And why is that? Well, any small deviation away from 0.5, such as an accidental generation where there are slightly more T's than A's or slightly more A's than T's, are going to lead to a slippery slope where the entire population moves towards that one direction. So if in one generation, by chance, there are more T's born than A's, then that means it's more likely that a T will meet another T, which means the T's will get even more fitter in the next generation, even if it was just by accident to begin with, until the T's will dominate the population. And likewise, if there are slightly more A's than T's. So this equilibrium will only maintain itself if exactly 0 0.5, 0 0.5 is maintained in each generation, which is just not gonna happen over time. So it's not stable. Okay. Let's move on to three rounds now. So we pick a random pair from the population. They play the prisoner's dilemma three times against each other. They reproduce on the basis of their fitness. They die, the next generation takes over. Well, again, nothing changes when an A plays an A or an A plays a T. Now when an A plays a T, it's three minus one in round one and zero, zero in round two and zero, zero in round three. The only cell that's changing in our payoff matrix is again when a T plays a T, because now they grab those benefits of, of uh, cooperation together and they build up two in every one of the three rounds, giving them six overall. Well, let's do the same thing and work out the expected payoffs. And what we find is that the expected payoff for T now 
7x minus 1 is bigger than the expected payoff for A exactly when X is larger than 1 quarter. Remember, X is the proportion with share T in the population, with trait T, rather. Okay, so now we only needed a smaller proportion of T's to begin with for the T's to take over, which sort of makes sense. You don't need as many T's because you're getting more benefit from each T. And what about if we just expand it now to n repetitions and look at it in a general context? Well, we can put in the payoffs now because we know that when a t plays a t, they're just getting 2 in every round. So for n rounds, it's just 2m. We can do the algebra and see that t is fitter than a whenever x is larger than 1 over 2n minus 1. Which makes sense because if we put in, for example, n is equal to 3 there, we get exactly x greater than 1 quarter, which is what we found for a thrice repeated prisoner's dilemma. So what's the story coming out of this? Well, as n gets larger, the number of repetitions gets larger, then cooperation can be sustained for a wider range of initial conditions. You don't need as many t's to begin with if you get to repeat more often with your partner. So what's this saying? Well, the value of establish, establish, establishing cooperation increases as the length of your interactions with people increases. And this kind of fits into one of the quotes, the many quotes of Charles Darwin, which have been put forward, but one of the quotes he's put forward, which relates a bit evolutionary game theory to the theory of evolution. He says, in the long history of humankind and animal kind too, those who learn to collaborate and improvise most effectively have prevailed. And here it's the idea about collaboration, the fact that with these multiple um, interactions that you're having, even though there might not actually be that many nice people in your population to begin with, over time and generations you'll prosper and that trait will start to take over the population. Now, there were only two different types in this environment, A and T. And that actually means that it's quite easy to check whether a potential monomorphic ESS is an ESS or not. We simply consider what happens if the whole population is of type A, and then we consider what would happen if a group of mutants of the other type tried to invade. Things get a little bit more complicated if we add in more types. So let's add in a third type now. We've seen three types before. We've seen, for instance, type C always cooperate. Very naive and seem to get screwed over pretty badly by type A before. So let's play the three shot prisoner's dilemma now, adding in this type as well. So we've added in the extra row and column. You can see that when a T plays a C, they just cooperate all the time. The tit for tat starts by cooperating sees that the type C is cooperating and they just cooperate back and forward. Um, meanwhile, the cooperator does very badly against type A um, in a three-shot prisoner's dilemma, earning minus three. Well, you might think that not much has changed. You might think, well, the C's aren't going to survive very long. The A's are just going to um, exploit them and we're down to A versus T uh, and we've seen that there are two possible um, equilibria coming out of that. Well, let's see if that's true or not. Can any of these three pure strategies be an ESS? Let's start with the easy ones. <coughs> a. Yes, A can be an ESS. If it's 100% type A, it's easy to check that introducing a type T or a type C doesn't help. We've actually, In fact, we've already basically tested this um, when it's all A, we know that a type uh, T invading can't do anything. So a type C invading, which is even more profitable for A, is certainly not going to help. So yeah, A is resistant, A is an ESS. Now C, unsurprisingly, is not a monomorphic ESS. It's easy to see that type A comes in and completely destroys the C population. So that's not an ESS. But what about type T? Now this is where things get a little bit more interesting. We can easily check that an all T population cannot be invaded by mutants of type A. In fact, we've already seen that before in our analysis of that two trait game. 
but in fact T is still not an ESS. It's got a special name called a neutral ESS and we'll see what the problem is. So to understand why the neutral um, ESS is not given the same strength and credibility as a normal ESS, consider what happens if our population is entirely type T, we know that A can't invade, and type C enters the mix, a small group of mutant type Cs. Well, they're not really going to compete against type T. In fact, we're basically looking at the bottom right corner, those four boxes with all the sixes in them. So the type C's come in and everyone's earning the same against everyone else that they play against. So the type C's can happily coexist, they can happily reproduce, everyone seems to be nice and happy. But if the proportion of C grows, that is between the C's and the T's, they can be fluctuating because they're just replacing each other basically in terms of fitness. But if the proportion of C grows beyond some point, then if a mutant group of A's come in, the A's, well, they're losing against the T's, but they can start doing really well against the C's. And if there are enough C's, so that the A's meet the C's more likely than they meet the T's, the fitness of A will actually grow overall to the point where it can actually take over the whole population. Now that's a lot of storytelling about what can happen, but we can even be a little bit more specific. Let X be the share of C and one minus X be that share of T. And then imagine that the fitness of, a, uh, imagine that a mutant A comes into it into the picture. Well, what's A going to get? Sorry, apologies. <laughs> what's A going to get? Well, the fitness of a mutant A is going to be 9 times C uh, times uh, the probability of meeting a C, X, plus 3 times 1 minus x, the probability of meeting uh, of meeting a t. So it's going to be 6x plus 3. On the other hand, the fitness of both c and t is going to be 6 because they're still meeting against other c's and against other t's. Thus a can invade x just so long as 6x plus 3 is greater than than 6 and that happens exactly when the share of C is large enough and in fact is the majority so long as it's more than 0.5. Apologies something wrong with my settings but we will we, we will truck on. Okay. Right, so we're going to leave the prisoner's dilemma now and we're going to move to actually a very closely related game which is kind of the, the game that underpins the history of evolutionary game theory. It's called the Hawk and the Dove game. Now, um, it's named after two types, Hawks and Doves, and obviously we're going to talk about those. And it is related to that uh, title page of the slides here, that sort of strange looking thing with different birds on the front. So in this population, you've got two types of animals. You've got the hawks and the doves, and they're going to randomly meet every now and then finding food. So they're foraging for food. They come across the food source together, a pair of those. The food has a value it's greater than zero. We'll call that value V. What happens? Well, the hawks, they're not really, it's not really about different birds, to be honest. It's about different personality traits and seeing which of these traits is going to succeed in the future. So the hawks have the trait of being very aggressive. They want to fight and they will fight to get the whole food. Doves, on the other hand, are peaceful. They would much prefer to share the food. They never fight. When a hawk meets a hawk, they fight, they fight to the death, and they're equally likely to win the whole food. They're similar creatures, it's 50-50. Either they get the whole food, or they lose and they get injured, and the injury comes at a cost, and we'll call that cost C. When a hawk meets a dove, that aggressive nature 
is very intimidating, it puts off the dove, the dove just leaves, and without a fight, without any cost of battling, the hawk gets the whole food, which is V, and the dove gets zero. When a dove meets another dove, <clears throat> they share the food without any injury, so no costs of fighting. And you can think about this trait in the animal kingdom, but you can also think about it at things you see if you ever go to the pub or to a nightclub, people sort of standing up to fight each other or things like this. Um, or even in international trade wars and bravado between different countries, different national defense, whatever. So we've got our hawks, we've got our doves, and we're going to write the game tree in very general terms with V and C. So when a dove plays a dove, the food is worth V, they split it. So that's where we're getting the V over two from. When a dove plays a hawk, the dove retreats and the hawk takes everything, V. When a hawk plays a hawk, there's a 50% chance of winning with a prize of V, and there's a 50% chance of losing with a prize of minus C. 50% chance of each of those, the expected payoff is V minus C over two. And we've got our payoff matrix. Now, there's a relationship here to games that we're quite familiar with depending on V and C. So if V is greater than C, we actually have a prisoner's dilemma where there's a dominant strategy and that is to be a hawk. So the hawks are gonna dominate the population. If V is less than C, then we have the game of chicken. Now I hesitate to bring another bird term into this already, but the game of chicken is kind of epitomized by these scenes in old movies where two guys in their cars drive at each other on an abandoned road with everyone watching. And basically whoever swerves to get out of the way loses the prize. So what happens? Do they just smash into each other? Well, then it's bad for both of them. So that's sort of the game of chicken. Who's the one who's gonna bluff first? Is it worth being brave? Is it not worth being brave? And there's actually a mixed strategy equilibrium to this stage game. So V greater than C, prisoner's dilemma, V less than C, game of chicken. And in the game of chicken, there are two pure Nash equilibria. Those are when basically one goes all hawk and manages to bluff out the other one who goes dove or vice versa. And there's this mixed strategy as well. And the mixed strategy comes with um, an easy probability for us to work out and for us to apply to this game. Each player plays hawk with exactly the probability V over C. So if V is greater than C, what can we say about equilibrium? Well, just as in the prisoner's dilemma, there's only one equilibrium. Here, the only ESS is that everyone's a hawk. The hawks are going to dominate. In fact, for any initial population, small h of hawks, we end up with hawk being the ESS, the final equilibrium. What if V is less than C? Well then mutants of each type can successfully invade a population of the other type. So this is where things get interesting. You can work out algebraically that if the initial proportion of hawks, little h, is less than V over C, then H is fitter than D. Hawk is fitter than dove. On the other hand, when there are fewer doves in the population, then the doves are actually growing in fitness the other way around. You can work out exactly this point V over C where this matters, um, or the other way to think about it is to realize that this is kind of like a tipping point, which must be exactly the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium of the rational stage game. There must be some sort of correspondence between the two. So what does that mean? Well, none of the two possible monomorphic equilibria can be ESS because they can both be invaded. There is only one stable point that no matter where we start from on the spectrum of initial points, we must converge to. And that is this polymorphic ESS where the proportion of hawks is exactly V over C. So now we've seen a different sort of type where we've got what I call a polymorphic um, ESS or a, a one ESS which has a mixed share in the population. Now we're going to add another type and this time we're actually going to add a mixing type 
into the population. So before we had those who were always aggressive and those who were always peaceful. Now we're adding a third type into the group who sometimes is aggressive and sometimes is peaceful. This type we're going to call M, the mixer. And let's go straight to the punch here. Let's make this mixer such that it plays a mixed strategy of hawk and dove at exactly what we think is this critical point, this tipping point. So the probability that it acts like a hawk and is aggressive around the food source is V over C. And with the probability one minus P or C minus V over C, it acts like a dove and it retreats. Now, which type do you think is going to have a higher expected fitness against M? Do you think the hawks will do better against M or do you think the doves will do better against M? Well, again, you can try to work this out algebraically or you can find the shortcut. And the shortcut is the fitnesses must be equal. And the way to see that they must be equal is that the probability that we chose for mixing is exactly that probability at the uh, mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. And we know that at that mixed strategy Nash e equilibrium, the reason it's in MSNE is because the expected payoffs for the pure types must be exactly balanced. So it's not really a surprise to us that the expected fitness must be equal. So let's call this expected fitness uh, K because it's going to make the algebra a little bit easier, but you can work that out to be V C minus V over two C. So then the next question is what happens to this new population with three possible types? And in particular, we know that all H cannot be an ESS and all D cannot be an ESS, but what about M? Can M be an ESS? Well, let's think about the different invasions that can happen if the entire population is made up of type M. Suppose a small fraction, little h, of hawks tries to invade a population of M. Then what is the expected payoff for a hawk? Well, you can work it out. It's equal to h v minus c over two, it's when you meet another hawk, plus one minus h times this k, this expected payoff k that we're going to just call k for simplicity but we know what it is from the previous slide. What about m? Well m has an expected payoff of h times p v minus c over 2 plus 1 minus h times k. So the fitnesses are almost equal but if v is less than c then m's fitness is a little bit higher. And in fact, uh, this is because uh, when the mixer is matched with a mutant of type H, M suffers that fighting cost some of the time, but then the rest of the time doesn't suffer that fighting cost because it acts like a dove. And because that fighting cost is dominating here, so V is less than C, it's good that the mixer sometimes decides to back off and be peaceful. Type H, on the other hand, is going to suffer this cost all the time when it plays another type H. So even though when meeting other mixers it's the same, there's a small difference when a mutant meets another mutant versus when a mixer meets a mutant hawk. So overall, M is going to be resistant to invasion by H, although not by very much, but still just enough. What about invasion by doves? So we're going to now imagine that a small fraction D of mutant doves tries to invade a population of M. Well, we can again work out the expected payoffs. D gets DV over 2 plus this 1 minus D times K, this 1 minus D times K part being the same uh, component of the payoff that we saw again for the hawks. And again, it's no surprise, they have to be balanced. What about M? Well, M gets 1 plus P DV over 2 plus this 1 minus D times K. Again, these fitnesses are almost equal, but we can see that 1 plus P DV over 2 must be bigger than DV over 2 because P is positive. So M's fitness is again marginally higher. That's because when it meets a mutant, when it meets a dove, some of the time it grabs a little bit of extra payoff by acting like a hawk. So M is also resistant to type M. So let's sum this up then, characterizing all the ESS of this three-type environment. 
If V is greater than C, we've got this prisoner's dilemma, the hawks are winning out, the value of the food is just too high, so only H is an ESS. If V is less than C, there's one ESS with a stable mixture, mixture of types, V over C percent hawks, one minus V over C percent doves, so that's the polymorphic equilibrium and one ESS which is monomorphic in this third type, M, in which type M mixes in exactly these proportions that we had above. So what are we finding here again? Well it's not the strongest of the species that survives, to quote another famous Charles Darwin saying, nor the most intelligent that survives, it's the one that is most adaptable to change. And here we're seeing an example of this quote happening because it's that mixing type that's willing to adapt its strategy when facing against other different types that's winning out overall. So our summary today, we've seen a different type of game theory that is quite similar to rational games but with a few little nuances that I think makes it also kind of cool. It can be applied to evolutionary biology or the evolution of personality traits, social norms, culture and so forth. It's a refinement of Nash equilibria. We've seen subgame perfection as one refinement of Nash equilibria. In evolutionary game theory it's that stability part that really refines it in ESS. And there's some parallels between ESS and Nash equilibria as we saw in the theorem as well as between um, mixing types and mixed strategy Nash equilibria. Alright, our homework is not going to be about evolutionary game theory though. We had the birthday puzzle as a little appetizer in preparation for our next week's lecture on common knowledge and now we're moving to the second appetizer or the preemie plate, the first course if you will. We're going to make things a little bit harder. This puzzle is called The Cheating Husbands. In the matriarchal city of Valeria, ruled by Queen Daenerys, there are 100 married couples, husband and wives. Everyone in the town lives by the following rules. If a husband cheats on his wife, the wife must report him to the queen, and the husband will be executed at dawn the following day. All the women in the town only gossip about the husbands of other women but no woman ever tells another woman if her husband is cheating on her. So every woman in the town knows about all the cheating husbands in the town except for her own. And husbands, husbands always remain silent. Got it? One day an outsider, Tyrion, visits the town. By hanging out with the gossiping women he comes to know about all the cheating and non-cheating husbands. The next day while leaving the town he announces to everyone there is at least one cheating husband in the town. What will happen? That's the question. What will happen? And it's tough because just imagine that in your town with a hundred different couples, the women all gossiping, every woman knows that four or five different men are cheating in the town, maybe more, 40, 50. So what's this information that Tyrion's giving when he says there's at least one cheating husband in the town and how does that change everything? Try to have a go at this. The way to think about it is to start by thinking about what happens if there's only one cheating husband, then what happens if there's two, and just like with our lions and lamb, build up from there. I'll leave you with this very fun and very interesting puzzle which we'll discuss at length in next week's lecture, our final lecture. Thanks a lot for listening.